on the left is still zero because we don't allow any of that material to pass through the membrane. And then the concentration on the right hand side has decreased. We've diluted the salt concentration. And when the system is at equilibrium here, that difference in the heights, that pressure difference from the head of the two fluids is equal to the osmotic pressure. And the osmotic pressure is only a function of those two fluids that we happen to deal with, in this case water and seawater. If we have a different osmotic pressure for different dissolved salts. So if I was using uh, calcium, calcium uh, CaSO4, calcium sulfate, that would be, have a different osmotic pressure than NaCl. Um, so you get different heights depending on the salt. But it's not a function of the membrane itself. So as long as that membrane is permeable and allowing the solvents to pass through, you will always get the same osmotic pressure. So that's, a, that's an important point. So osmotic pressure is not a function of the membrane that's uh, separating those two. And at equilibrium, we're getting equal transfer of solvent, the water phase, between the left and the right hand side. So those two arrows are balancing each other out, but the solvent flow is, is, is at equilibrium. Okay, so that's osmosis. Osmosis is that ability for, for material to pass as, as shown there through the membrane and create a pressure difference or a difference in head. And you can, you can, you can try this at home. There's an experiment uh, where you can take up a carrot. So a carrot is a membrane. The cellular structure of a carrot is a semi-permeable membrane that will allow fluid to transfer through it. If you hollow out the center of the carrot and you fill it with a salt water solution, and you put a straw in it, and you close the carrot back up and seal it with candle wax, and then suspend that carrot in water. So you've got pure water on the outside of the carrot, and you've got salt water on the inside. You're going to drive water from the outside of the carrot through into the carrot, and it's going to start to go up the straw. Okay, so as long as you seal that straw on the, on the edge of the carrot, so you've got a, a, a good seal over there. The water that's diffusing into the carrot from the neutral solvent into this more concentrated salt water solution on the interior of the carrot is going to then be forced up the straw. So that, that uh, will take a couple of hours then to happen. Um, another, we'll talk about another application so you can also try it on in a minute. So that's, that's the principle of osmosis. Now reverse osmosis is if we take this further and I increase the pressure over there on the right hand side by raising the level of the, of the seawater mixture. So I'm exceeding the osmotic pressure. I will then have a net flow of solvent of the water through the membrane to the water side. So I can achieve that in two ways. I can lower the level of water over here so I, I create a greater head or I can just add more seawater to the right hand side. Either one of those as long as I exceed that osmotic pressure head, that, that pressure difference from osmotic, uh, due to osmotic back pressure, I will start to flow solvent then in the opposite direction than would normally happen. And this is what we'll do with reverse osmosis. So we're reversing osmosis and then going even further still by applying even greater pressure. And we're then purifying our salt and solvent mixture on the right hand side and essentially getting a pure water stream, a pure solvent stream on the left. Okay, so the key assumption here that I've made is that, um, uh, that there's no solute passing through that barrier. I will in fact relax that assumption in a few slides from, from here. The solvent is the, is the material that passes freely through the membrane. And it's that chemical potential due to the solvent mixture, uh, sorry, the solvent, pure water and the mixture that's causing this uh, osmosis, osmosis to occur. Okay, so, and then the, the, the other important point here is that um, it's a thermodynamic property. It's only a function of um, the fluids and the mixture itself. It's not a function of the membrane. Okay, so uh, osmosis is, is, is used um, by nature to move water up trees. So, you may have learned incorrectly that it's capillary action that drives water up the trees from the roots up to the leaves. That's not correct. If that were the case, trees would only grow to about 10 meters high. Um, because after 10 meters, you're counteracting capillary action 
there's no more atmospheric pressure to, to counter. Oh, sorry, you'll be counteracted by the atmospheric pressure. So we have trees greater than 10 meters. It's not, it's not the mechanism, certainly not the only mechanism that cools uh, water up to the leaves. It is osmosis. And we'll actually calculate numerically uh, what that height can be. So it's osmosis that brings the uh, water from the roots up to the up, upper leaves of the tree and feeds the cells. And then there's evaporation out from those leaves, so there's a reduction in the water content, and then it just keeps the driving force going. We're removing water out from the leaves through evaporation, and then new water is being pulled up through the roots through osmosis. Um, you may have heard that if you put salt on snails and slugs, or if you've ever tried it, you, they, they die quite rapidly. It's the same idea. You're essitially you're surrounding that snail's membranes, cellular membranes, with a very highly concentrated salt solution. You're driving the water out of the cells, and that snail is going to shrivel up and shrink and die. Uh, freshwater fish uh, go into salt water and vice versa. So please don't. It's not very gruesome examples of killing snails and killing fish, but uh, uh, the one that you should try at home is this last one here, where you can take a peeled potato instead. Try this one. Uh, cut up the potatoes, two potato cubes equal size. Uh, place one in very, very salty water, and the other in just normal water. What will happen to the cube that you put in salty water? So that's osmosis, uh, take the driving and driving the, uh, the solvent out. So the, the key here is that if you exceed the osmotic pressure, you get to reverse that natural osmosis, osmosis that occurs, uh, and we call that process then reverse osmosis. So what's the net driving force? In this, in this system over here, what's driving that solvent? over to the left hand side. Um, but if we play around with the units, 
and we get them into those units over there. That is the, the regular gas constant. And we use those units because these are going to be more suitable for us osmosis type calculations. So we're dealing with moles, we're dealing with temperature and Kelvin as, as usual, um, but we're dealing with atmospheres and then the, the main is the volume on a volume basis. So VM then in the denominator here, or N divided by VM uh, simplifies down to the concentration of the, the salt of the ions. Uh, but VM specifically refers to the volume of the solvent associated with the solute. What I mean by that is, um, if we go back to this illustration, it would be the volume over here on the right hand side. It's not the volume of the pure solvent side of the membrane. So VM refers to the volume of the solvent that's associated with the solutes that we're uh, deriving from the small, the small pressure for. T is temperature measured in Kelvin. And then C is moles of ions per meter cubed. Uh, I the notes there was a minor typo over there. So that's per meter cubed, not per meter to the minus three. OK, so uh, try this calculation at home. Uh, if you take 0.1 mole of salt and you dissolve it in a liter of water, you should calculate that you get an osmotic pressure of 4.9 atmospheres. So make sure that you can do that calculation. That's a substantial pressure. So if we put it in perspective, 0.1 mol of sodium chloride is just under 6 grams. So a teaspoon of salt dissolved in a liter of water will generate 5 liters of head. Just think about this. Does it even sound plausible? So such a very minor concentration of salts in water will be able to generate a pressure difference in a capillary tube I took a plastic tube and I put six grams of sodium chloride on top of that of that plastic tube, and the bottom of that tube was in a pool of water. It would create and pull up water up to a height of five meters. That's an incredible amount of head for such a small amount of salt. And um, you can prove this that a guy wired up a plastic tube along a cliff or a wall. Um, and then did exactly that. You lower a bit of salt in the top of that, and you can see this tremendous amount of head being created and pulled up to, for this osmosis to try and neutralize that, that pressure difference. And that's why trees are so effective at, at pulling uh, water up and growing to the height that they do. So if we take a look at some typical concentrations, uh, 0.1 mole of sodium chloride in a liter of water, that's the one we just looked at. Notice this number is a little bit different to the one I showed you earlier. It's 4.56 atmospheres. If we calculate with the front off equation, we get 4.9. That's the calculated value. The experimental value is 4.56. So this is the actual osmotic pressure. Um, so it's a good, a good approximation. Two moles of sodium chloride will generate 100 pieces of head, 96 atmospheres. Okay. And then seawater will generate the 25 meter head, or the roughly 25 atmospheres. So, so those are tremendous amounts of pressures that we have to overcome when we have salts dissolved in a solvent. Now, our usual pressure difference uh, in a membrane separation is what drives drives the separation. That's what we, we've applied so far. Now, if we only went and applied a pressure difference that was equal to the osmotic pressure, we would essentially be doing nothing. We'd just be counteracting osmosis, and the two sides um, would be in equilibrium, with only the solvents passing equally from, this, from the permeate to the retentate, from the retentate to the permeate. We just have this equal balance of flux of the solvent, if, if that's all we apply. So, for reverse osmosis to be an effective separation, um, we have to then put in an additional amount of energy. Uh, so increase delta P to exceed that osmotic pressure. Uh, so our net driving force then is, that, is the difference between the osmotic pressure and delta P. And what we usually find is, uh, you can just treat this as a rough rule of thumb, that if the osmotic pressure is a certain amount of pi, the delta P that we apply in, in practice in a reverse osmosis membrane is usually about 25 to 30 times the uh, natural osmotic pressure. So just by looking at a number of case studies of what's being separated, and you calculate the pi value, um, and then or you, you, you ex determine the pi from experimental data, and then you, you look at the delta p's that are typically used, 
Uh, delta P would usually be about 25 to 30 times the osmotic pressure is, is then applied. So that additional pressure is used then just to drive through those very, very small holes that we use then on the membrane. Those, the membranes for reverse osmosis have incredibly small pore diameters, and so we have to apply this tremendous amount of additional pressure to overcome uh, that, that resistance. So the, the key issue here is that in, in reverse osmosis, our membranes are providing significant resistance uh, to, to us that we need to overcome that pressure difference in addition to the osmotic pressure. So just some numbers here that in ultrafiltration we were looking at values that ranged up to 1 MPA for typical separation at the high end. Reverse osmosis, we start at about 2 MPA and we go all the way up to 10 MPA to, to drive that separation. So an order of magnitude greater energy requirements for reverse osmosis. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's fix up that assumption that I said earlier that we would, we would assume that the permeate side has no salt. That, that membrane is perfectly able to retain the salt. But that's not true. That salt uh, will diffuse through the membrane. So if we're thinking of sodium chloride and dissolved salts like that, these are not solid molecules that exist on the, on the, on the feed side. We're not dealing with totally fluid uh, uh, feed, that salt will diffuse through the membrane as well. The solvent will diffuse through the membrane as well. The solvent will diffuse much, much faster through the membrane. And the salt's diffusion or permeability through the membrane is much slower. So we're relying on that difference in the, in the permeabilities uh, to, to drive the separation in the those osmosis. So, we do eventually get a non-zero, or we will get a non-zero concentration of salt on the permeate side, which up to now in the, in the section on membranes, we've always assumed zero, but here that's, that's not the case. What will happen then is you will have salts dissolved on the permeate side, and that's also going to have its own osmotic pressure in the, in the, in the opposite direction. So we'll call that uh, high perm, so the osmotic pressure on the permeate side. And so then our driving force is delta P, the, the usual delta P that we've seen up to now, the transmembrane pressure, but minus uh, what we'll call delta pi. Delta pi then is the, 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 the osmotic pressure on the feed side, or due to the feed, I should say. Uh, so this is the osmotic pressure due to the feed side at very, very high concentration of ions in the feed side. And then Pi permeate is then the concentration of salts on the permeate side. So we can then substitute in our, our regular localization using the quantum Hoff equation, the C concentration of ions in the feed side. That's a, a number we're comfortable with from before. This time though it's in moles per liter would be um, the concentrations unit. So moles of ions per liter of feed times the R uh, constant times the temperature of the feed minus the concentration of ions in the permeate side times R times T. Now, let's be even a little bit more correct is that there may be, in some situations, a buildup of ions against the wall of that membrane. Okay, so like concentration polarization that we saw with ultrafiltration, where we have this buildup of solids or a higher concentration at the wall, we do, in some cases, get that occurring with reverse osmosis, especially when the ions that are dissolved in the membrane are not very soluble in the, in the solvent phase. They may be, uh, they have some somewhat low solubility and tend to form a small boundary at the wall. Those concentration of ions then would be the more appropriate concentration term to use uh, rather than the feed concentration. Um, as, as your osmotic pressure. But then we also subtract off the, us, the, up the other osmotic pressure that's counteracting that from the permeate side back to the feed. So when we, when we look at our driving force then in reverse osmosis, that's the term we'll use in, in, the, in the usual flux equation. So flux is equal to driving force divided by resistance. That delta P, the usual transmembrane pressure that we apply through pumps and external energy, minus the natural resistance that comes from osmosis. 
any questions up to this point, just on that, on that, the conceptual idea of osmosis and reverse osmosis? Okay, so let's take a look at the typical application area. The most widely used application uh, for reverse osmosis is for desalination. Even since the 60s, late 60s, when um, Ken Coops had the name and the photos of those two guys, Moob and Suri Bajan, I can't, I don't remember the exact name off the top of my head, I apologize for that. But uh, those two researchers developed the technology for asymmetric membranes, and the first applications were immediately for desalination. Uh, the market for desalination and the, uh, the size of that has grown substantially since then, but even back in the 80s, uh, about 20% of drinking water was, was cleaned up through, through reverse osmosis. Rather than using electrical means and, and filtration and other means, even since the 80s, a, a very high percentage of, of the worldwide drinking water has been cleaned up through reverse osmosis. And it's growing and at, at a tremendous rate because there's no heating required, um, and then the only energy input is delta P, which is easy, easy to generate. And since the, since the 80s, there have been actually a number of patents on um, retrieving back that pressure energy and recovering it and reusing it. So uh, the, I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. So the, the market for reverse source uh, is, is phenomenal uh, just in terms of growth rates here. So the predicted value for 2012, this was back in 2008, the prediction for this year was the market size of about five to six billion. Dollars. Uh, that's a phenomenal growth from uh, just five years, uh, four years prior to that. Uh, another, uh, another prediction here was for uh, 20, 2020. The market size was expected to reach 52 billion um, for global desalination by all means of desalination. Um, but then the membrane technology reverse osmosis would see the largest growth, reaching 40 billion. So $40 billion of the $50 billion that's spent on, de on desalination will be uh, due to reverse osmosis and membranes. There's applications beyond desalination as well. Um, so companies will install reverse osmosis primarily for demineral demineralization of their industrial waters. Um, so they will take industrial or municipal water, demineralize it through a reverse osmosis membrane. And the main reason for doing that is if they retain those minerals there, they will uh, start to precipitate and cake up iron, uh, heat exchangers and, and other boiler uh, surface areas and reduce the heat transfer ability. So these companies will install a reverse osmosis, then perhaps a second uh, unit, an iron exchange unit, to totally remove the minerals from the municipal water stream before they use that in their uh, boiler feeds and their heat exchangers and steam lines. In, in. So that's where you will more, more than likely see reverse osmosis. Um, but you may also see it, for example, if you go work in a pharmaceutical industry um, or some, some high purity foods and manufacturing will use this uh, to generate a purified water stream on site. They'll have a small reverse osmosis membrane. Um, Dewatering of, of fruit juices. Uh, it's also used for dealcoholization of wine and beer uh, for, for that market. Um, in terms of, so just to come back here to the dewatering, in uh, 95, the cost of that would have been in the order of five cents per liter to de, uh, to dewater or concentrate out those those juices. So, so those are those are other areas where it's used. It's also used uh, very effectively to treat waste. Uh, companies will use a reverse osmosis uh, to treat their wastes before discharging the permeate to municipal water. So, on the retentate side, they will retain things like antifreeze, paint, uh, polyacyclic. Uh, these uh, ring, ring hydrocarbons, I forget the acronym, but these are very toxic uh, hydrocarbons that wouldn't be allowed in waste for streams, pesticides and so forth. These are all retained and then allowing that permeate to go into to regular municipal treatments. So this is uh, more than likely where you'll see it. 
Now, I do have uh, some videos here for you to take a look at. This first one here is uh, in your own time, please. It's an uh, interesting video on just how spiral membranes are made. So sometimes the drawings we have in our notes for those spiral core membranes are pretty light to understand what's going on there. But this is a nice animation of how those layers build up into, into that module. And then the second one is, is a, a very interesting animation of how the pressure energy is recoverable. Um, in, a, in, a, in a reverse osmosis or in any um, uh, membrane application, but primarily in reverse osmosis because we have to put such high delta P in, uh, we don't want to just lose that pressure energy, we want to recover it in, in a, if possible. And there, this, uh, this technology here shows you a very, very nice animation of how that's done. And that would be used, for example, in, in a facility like this. We've seen this photo before. This is uh, from Cyprus. This, so island states between Greece and Turkey. Um, and this was a, uh, this company, IDE Tech, uh, which is where I got some of this information and photo from, um, they are a, they're a company that would, would build these units. So what they do is they operate under a business model called Bot or Boot, uh, build, own, operate, and transfer. So they will build it, they will own it, and operate it, and they'll do that for about 10 to 15 years. And then they'll transfer the ownership over to, uh, say, the Ministry of the Environment for Cyprus in this instance, or, uh, or some other owner then will take over and operate the plant from that from then on. And they will probably provide maintenance. Okay? So they take on the risk for the first 10 to 15 years to make sure the plant gets up and running and meets the required uh, throughputs. In this case, 21 and a half million meters cubed per year, or 64,000 meters cubed per hour. Uh, which which makes sense if you see this small uh, this number of modules over here. So the typical flow sheet is, is linear. There's no recycle, no feedback, or anything on this. So we take our salt water in, flocculate the filtrate. Why would we do that? Primarily for fouling. The any any particular material we want to get rid of. This ultrafiltration membrane has a very, very small pores and we don't want to clog them up. Uh, we want to keep those pores primarily to allow the solvents to diffuse through to the permeate side. Uh, so this is a, a step to remove any small solids and even some bacteria would be removed in this in this uh, step. And then we would go to reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis does that, uh, the, uh, it cleans it up and, and takes it down to the permeate. Now, what's interesting is the tremendous amount of, um, not waste, but the, just the splits in the stream. So if we look at our feed to reverse osmosis, we have our feed coming into the membrane. For a particular membrane, we have the feed And then our permeates and retentate. Any idea what the splits are between the permeate flow rates and the retentate flow rates? Typical values. One, two, three. Yeah, so it's 25, 75 splits. Yeah. Any other guesses? These reverse osmosis units that you can buy for your kitchen at home, that you plug into your uh, municipal water feed, and then you would be drinking from the permeate side. Uh, from the yeah, you'd be drinking from the permeate side. How much of the is goes to retentate and essentially gets wasted? It could be as high as sixty percent in some of these commercial units. So you're only really effectively using forty percent of that permeate and then wasting the other 60% or recycling it back again. Um, or in, unfortunately in home units that essentially does just get wasted down the drain. So so that's uh, in, in these facilities they would they would recycle that but um, there's a it's, it's not a very high uh, split, it's not a very high recovery of in terms of volumetric flow rates that come out of the permeate. So that's the reverse osmosis step, and then you would have chemical dosing. This is a step that's done to neutralize any of the dissolved salts uh, that, would, that may still be present. 
so we should now be treating chemically to neutralize the salt salt, but we are, our chemical requirements here would be much, much smaller than it would otherwise be if we had not done reverse osmosis. Then there's a chlorination step to kill any bacteria and then that goes out to, to drinking water. And then companies like this would employ some, some technology to recover some of that pressure energy. So that's, that's in the YouTube video. So just uh, some more ideas of the cost. So I'll just, I, I won't go through this table and you can read it at your own time. Um, the reason why I put it up there is we started to think for, for the project that you have to do, you have to look at an estimate of capital costs and operating costs for a unit. Uh, these would be typical numbers uh, that you would, would try to find numbers like these for the unit that you're sizing for your project. Um, maybe not all the, not as detailed as this, but certainly on this conceptual level, we're looking for cost per unit uh, product, total capital cost per, per product per day, for operating costs. Um, and if you look at a household reverse osmosis unit, that's you're paying on the order of uh, one and a half cents to seven cents per liter, um, just in terms of the operating costs of that unit. I uh, sorry, the, the capital costs, not 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 for the water itself that you're feeding. So that just gives you an idea a bit about the market and the application areas. Now let's take a look at, at some of the more. Um, the key equation is the one that we've been dealing with the whole way through. That the flux J is the permeability times the driving force um, divided by the thickness. So we, we often love about permeability divided by thickness, and we call that term permeance. That's an easier term to measure um, or calculate, back calculate, because we can we can always calculate our driving force um, and we can measure our flux quite easily. So then permeance, then that lumped parameters we need to back calculate. Or as it's sometimes, as we would see it uh, from a mass transfer perspective, uh, inverse permeance, and we call that resistance. So permeability, or the permeance, uh, then would be a function only of the membrane itself, the membrane's pore structure, the thickness of it. Sorry, permeability, I'm just looking at permeability, I'm not considering the membrane thickness. Uh, just that numerator term, then it's just a function of the pore structure of the membrane, the diff diffusivity of the solvent through the membrane, and the physical properties of the solutes and solvents um, in that, in that uh, area. So uh, just a note here on the units, always check that. If I'm, I, I'm not putting units on the slide because there are no consistent units. Every book will use different sets of uh, uh, units, atmospheres, some will use pascals. The driving, for the driving force, the plus J is then often in meters cubed uh, per meter squared per hour, or sometimes it's mass Mass flux. So there's no sense in trying to give up, uh, put some units here. It's very case dependent. Now, what I'll do is here is we'll look at some of this, this modeling for reverse osmosis, but we'll make, a, make an assumption that we're not building up any K on that membrane surface. And that's a, that's a very reasonable assumption to make because we've got these upstream units that remove any of the solid particles out of the stream for us. And we're really just looking at the dissolved salts that are suspended in the solvent. So our driving force in delta P is, 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 is put in. Um, and we've got to put in a delta P of that transmembrane pressure that's sufficient to overcome the osmotic pressure as well as the membrane's resistance. That's the key uh, resistance that we're going to face. So if we look at our, our, our equation that we saw earlier, we've got our driving force, delta P minus the um, the osmotic pressure difference. And then in our denominator, we'd be comfortable with seeing the resistance to the membrane and then the resistance due to the cake pull-up. That's the term I'm assuming goes to zero here. So essentially, we've got just the, the membrane's resistance. That's, that's our, our main, main issue to overcome. And then we've also got to overcome the osmotic resistance, but that's taken into account over there by, sort of by diminishing our driving force. We've, we've taken that into account in the numerator, and then our resistance due to uh, moving that solvent through very, very small pores on the membrane is in the denominator. Or, as, some, as you'll more than likely see it, um, this RMV's terminology that I, I tend to use as a resistance from a mass transfer perspective, but most books will, will break it down into the two constituent terms. There's the permeability of the solvent through the membrane divided through by the length or thickness of that um, part of the, that the solvent has to travel, so the, the, the membrane thickness itself. So, so let's 
So that's that's the one um, the one flux. We also have a second flux. We have a flux due to the solvent. So we measure in let's say meters cubed of solvent per hour per meter squared of memory. So that's the solvent flux measured in a, usually on a volumetric basis. So meters cubed of solvent per hour per meter squared of area. But we also have the flux due to the solute. The salt itself has, has a flux. We're moving that salt um, through the membrane. And it's proportional to the driving force. The driving force is then the difference in concentration across that membrane. So on the one side of the membrane, we have the wall concentration. And on the other side of the membrane, we have the permeate concentration. That difference in those concentrations is driving the salt through the membrane. That salt, those dissolved salts, these are not solid particles anymore that we've been used to seeing in ultrafiltration. These are the dissolved salts. Those dissolved ions will permeate through the membrane much, much slower. So this permeability number that we see here for P-salt up in the numerator over here, P-salt should be a much, much smaller value than P-solvent. It's got to be because we don't want J-salt, the flux of the salt through the membrane to be high. We want the salts to be retained on the retentate side. So that permeability of the salt uh, must, be, uh, must, be, must be a smaller number. Um, so what we, can, what we can sometimes do is because we don't estimate the wall concentrations, it's impossible to measure. What we, what we will make this, is this assumption, and this is not an assumption you should carry over to ultrafiltration. This assumption really works well for reverse osmosis, is we will assume that that wall concentration is approximately equal to the bulk concentration, and we'll even go further still and say that that's approximately equal for very crude estimation to the feed concentration. How would you make or ensure that those assumptions hold? What would you do to make that assumption of the wall concentration, the bulk concentration, hold? Concentration matches the bulk concentration um, is obviously not 
you can't make that exact approximation. We, we must have our retained tape leaving the bulk concentration must be lower than the feed concentration, otherwise this membrane is not doing anything. For us. So you can never say that this is an exact equality, but for rough calculations, it's a, it's, it's a fairly reasonable assumption to make at the beginning. Just to get estimates of the salt flux, um, to get estimates of that number. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I mean, we've got about three, four minutes here. Let's just uh, start this example then, and uh, you, can, you, you must be able to complete this up at home. We've got brackish water. So brackish water is um, it's uh, water that's retrieved from wells, from groundwater that's got a high high concentration of salts in it, uh, but not not as high as, as seawater. So brack, brackish water, which is a, a, a big um, source of water for industry in remote areas, they would then tap into a water well um, into, the, into the table of the, the groundwater. But though there's a, there's a high concentration of salts in it. So if we make this assumption that all the salts are actually just sodium chloride, which it would never be, but um, let's, let's make that assumption that it's 1.8 weight percent sodium chloride at ambient temperatures. We're going to pressurize that and feed it to a spiral well membrane at 1,000 psi. So that's my feed side. My permeate side then is 0 0.05 weight percent. Same temperature and uh, the pressure on the on the retail, on the permeate side then is 50 psi. So those uh, those technologies then to recover the pressure, refer, we we always have to spend about uh, 50 uh, that pressure drop through the through the membrane, but can we recover any of the remaining pressure? That's what those other technologies in the that future video is about. Uh, but okay, so let's take a look here. Then we've got the permeance of water has been established. So permeance of water through the membrane. That refers to this number up here, P salt. The permeance of the water, um, yeah, sorry, it's, it's actually permeance is P salt divided by L. This whole term lumped together is equal to permeance. How would you establish that value? From an experiment. There's also the uh, permeability of the salt that's determined experimentally. Um, I said that we won't cover this in the course. I, I'll look at that. I may actually show some, some experimental set of how to calculate that number. But then we can get that permeability, uh, perme permeance of the salt. What I'd like you to do then, and uh, I, I, this is so easy, I don't even need to go through this in class next time. I can simply close the solutions up, right? right. Yeah, you guys can do this, it's easy. So make sure that you can do this. Just calculate the flux of the water in LMH, calculate the flux of the salt, then look at those fluxes, do compare them, do that make sense. And then step four and five is, uh, we'll, we'll start here next time, is to calculate the rejection coefficients and separate. 